Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Happy Tuesday, everybody. This week, the U.S. is holding a bilateral summit with Japan, as well as a trilateral summit with Japan and the Philippines. The South China Sea, and specifically the Second Thomas Shoal, will certainly be on the agenda. In an exclusive published yesterday, UK-based The Financial Times reports, citing two senior U.S. officials, that U.S. President Biden will express concern this week about the situation around the Second Thomas Shoal, and once again stress that the U.S.-Philippine Mutual Defense Treaty applies to the Sierra Madre, adding that he expressed deep concern when he spoke to Xi Jinping last week. One of the officials reportedly told the outlet, quote, China is underestimating the potential for escalation. We've tried to make that clear in a series of conversations that our mutual defense treaty covers Philippine sailors and ships, and by extension, the Sierra Madre. China needs to examine its tactics or risk some serious blowback, end quote. Japan's Prime Minister Kishida has made similar points in recent days, too. Quote, In our neighborhood, there are countries that are developing ballistic missiles and nuclear weapons, and others that are building up their defense capabilities in an opaque way. Also, there is a unilateral attempt to change the status quo by force in both the East China Sea and South China Sea. Building Japan's deterrence and response capability is essential for the alliance with the United States. End quote. Kishida is addressing Congress on Thursday. Plans for American and Japanese military commanders to work alongside each other in Tokyo will also be spelt out at the bilateral talks this week. Meanwhile, several senior U.S. officials are reportedly pushing for Japan to join AUKUS as a pillar two partner. Yesterday, Monday, the U.S., U.K. and Australian defense ministers said that they were considering working with Japan through the security pact aimed at boosting deterrence against China. Pillar 2 is part of the partnership that focuses on advanced technology, ranging from artificial intelligence and quantum computing to undersea capabilities and hypersonic weapons. However, UK-based Reuters reports that Australia and Britain, and some in the US government, argue that it is too early to add a partner, saying that the three original members should first smooth out difficulties in working on highly classified projects that require the sharing of highly secret information. Quote, there are also concerns that Japan still has not done enough to ensure it can protect sensitive data. End quote. As part of the Anglophone Five Eyes Security Pact, the UK, US and Australia already have decades of experience and infrastructure in place for sharing highly sensitive military information. Japanese commentators have become increasingly vocal about what they perceive as a Chinese threat too. Shingo Yamagami, the former Japanese ambassador to Australia, published a sharply worded op-ed in Australia-based The Australian. Quote, in Australia, even while I was there, the intelligence agency's director general was told by some inside and outside the government to ease up on their counterintelligence activities. I was told by several Australians in politics and government to seal my lips on the subject of China. Developments since my departure suggest Australia's language regarding its own and now shared deteriorating security environment is narrowing. The world's eyes a few short years ago were focused on Australia when it stood tall under tremendous diplomatic pressure and economic coercion by the Middle Kingdom. It was no exaggeration to say Australia gained a prominent international status through its resilience and principled approach. That is the Australia I admired and respected. The emphasis on stabilizing relations with China is fine, but stabilization should not mean staging photo opportunities or smiling and shaking hands with China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi while guns are being pointed at your head as they are in the South China Sea. End quote. Meanwhile, in Beijing, Chinese commentators are not very happy either. Yesterday, in anticipation of the upcoming summit, state-run Xinhua wrote in a special commentary, quote, The involvement of external actors in joint naval exercises and the upcoming trilateral summit among the Philippines, the United States, and Japan reveal a stark truth. The Philippines is recklessly exploiting these platforms to solicit external support for its provocative actions. The Philippines is being used as a pawn and a proxy. End quote. This week, too, Professor Su Hao at China Foreign Affairs University in Beijing published a report called United States, Japan, and Philippines Strategic Triangle to Complete a Structural Security Blockade Against China. The PRC Ministry Foreign Affairs Affiliated Report argues, quote, Recently, the Philippines has actively provoked confrontations and frictions over disputed islands and reefs in the South China Sea. 
leading to structural changes in the situation in the South China Sea and posing an increasingly urgent challenge to China's surrounding security. The focus of the United States' Indo-Pacific strategy pressure on China is shifting from the Taiwan Strait to the South China Sea, attempting to use the disputed islands and reefs between China and the Philippines as a flashpoint to provoke conflict. The South China Sea conflict has become a lever to pry the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy, creating a military encirclement situation against China that links the South China Sea, the Taiwan Strait, and the East China Sea. Three seas linkage thereby severing the overall coordination and cooperation relationship between Asia and China. The situation could further mobilize U.S. allies in the Asia-Pacific to act in unison and collaborate with NATO's eastward efforts, leading to a severe scenario of comprehensive pressure and blockade against China across all domains, with Southeast Asia as the link. End quote. On Sunday, we did a deep dive into Southeast Asian elite attitudes towards China, the U.S., and the current security environment in East Asia and Southeast Asia. That is worth a watch for anyone interested in this space. As we can see, the pieces continue to move, and the security situation in the region continues to deteriorate. We move into a dangerous year indeed. Let's continue. According to official data from the Ministry of Culture and Tourism, domestic travel and spending during China's recent tomb sweeping festival topped pre-COVID levels for the first time, a sign, some argue, that consumption may be recovering. Total tourism spending over the three-day holiday rose 12.7% versus 2019 on a comparable basis to 7.5 billion US dollars. That works out at some 453 yuan per trip, up 1.1% from 2019. Goldman Sachs Group Inc. and City Group Inc. said this marks the first time that per trip holiday spending has topped pre-pandemic levels. People made 119 million trips in the country over the break, which went from the 4th of April through the 6th, up 11.5% from 2019. Most trips were taken on the country's roads during the break, with close to 683 million trips, up 19.6% versus 2019. And rail travel was in second place, with 49.7 million trips, 20.6% higher than 2019 levels. China Great Wall Securities co-analysts wrote in a note yesterday, quote, This indicates that household tourism consumption potential and willingness were released fully. We expect services expenditure as a share of total consumption will increase further this year, driving the recovery of household consumption to some extent. End quote. Not all are convinced by these arguments, however. Quote, that might be a little optimistic. Spending may be up 1.1% since 2019, but in those four years, real GDP was up 20% and nominal GDP up 28%. This suggests that Chinese are spending a far smaller share of their income per trip than they were in 2019. End quote. Next up, we have one more development to cover. If you're enjoying today's episode, it's a huge help if you can do me the favor of hitting the like button. And for those regular viewers who are not subscribed, subscribing is also a big help. Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee links are also in the description below for those who want to help me keep the channel financially sustainable. I make all these episodes myself and I want to keep them open and free for all six days a week and not reliant on corporate sponsorship. So your help in this regard is the only way I can make this happen. Thank you so much, everybody, for the ongoing support. The Foreign Correspondents Club of China has published its latest working conditions report called Masks Off, Barriers Remain. The executive summary of the report explained that difficulties persisted in spite of an improving reporting environment due to the end of China's tough zero COVID policy and related restrictions on movement, restoring reporters' ability to move around the country relatively freely. Quote, a vast majority of FCCC members welcome China's reopening, with 81% saying conditions had improved somewhat in 2023 compared to the pandemic period. However, the return of mobility has also meant more correspondence dealing with the type of heavy-handed responses to independent reporting in the field that long predated the pandemic. End quote. The report found that an incredible 0% of respondents said reporting conditions surpassed pre-pandemic conditions. Almost all respondents, 99%, said reporting conditions in China rarely or never meet international reporting standards. The report concludes that the results of this year's survey show Quote, significant obstacles remain for independent reporting in China, especially in the form of heightened intimidation and surveillance, both in person and through more sophisticated digital means. 
end quote. Reporting trips during which foreign journalists do not experience problems are the exception, the report says. Quote, the system cannot tolerate any media that it cannot control, directly or through inducements, and the rough treatment of foreign reporters, many of whom start with an affinity for the PRC, does not help their stated goals of improving China's image and generating positive energy. End quote. Okay, that is today's episode of China Update. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. Have a good Tuesday, and I will see you all tomorrow.